My name is Karen Keene, and I work as a freelance WordPress developer as well as a um, project manager for other people's projects. Um, I got my start as a um, project manager actually at an agency, um, and I spent a number of years working uh, within that agency setting, and then eventually moved over into being a freelancer because I wanted to be able to give my clients a little bit more of that personal touch that you can do when you're just working on your own. Um, but while I was working um, in the agency setting, I was able to learn a lot about client communication from um, some of the different managers and COOs that I worked with um, and from that foundation I've been able to move on from there and continue to learn more and more about how to set up good client communication so that way these projects that we're running are able to go really smoothly. Um, in addition to working as a developer I'm also a podcast and audio drama creator. I got a degree in film screenwriting specifically uh, so I like to bring a lot of storytelling into uh, my development projects and tend to focus on that a lot. Um, so that's a little bit about me and um, basically where I come from. So how, as a quick question to the room, how many of you are currently either working with clients directly or through like a project manager of some kind? Okay, awesome. And how many of you are having some conflict or some trouble with those clients from time to time? Oh, never. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's kind of what I was expecting. It's super, like, this is just a very common thing with um, freelance projects especially. As you're talking to clients and working with clients, there's always going to be some elements of conflict, um, and the question is, how do we help to avoid that or, or make that better? All right. So we're going to start off with work sure would be great if not for the clients. Um, <laughs> I've heard that phrase said by so many people. I have even uttered it myself. Um, where we love what we do. We love designing or developing or working with analytics or developing UX. Whatever it is that you do, you're in it because you love doing it. And getting into these sticky situations with your clients just makes you miserable because it is miserable. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the wonderful website called Clients from Hell. Um, I love them. They uh, get pe user submissions from different people who tell their stories of these kind of horror stories with clients. Um, and I pulled a few of those from here for us to look at today. Um, but oftentimes our clients do. They just drive us crazy and it feels like maybe they're coming from hell. They either have a serious lack of knowledge um, such as this lovely example where they feel like the target audience is males and females, they have zero it up. Which is good, they excluded fetuses, I guess, so that's a step in the right direction of audience definition. Um, or they might have really, really horrible ideas, like, like here, but they think that they should say sup, because kids say sup. Um, you know, or with feedback that is absolutely impossible to use. Um, I was talking with some of my developer friends in preparation for this and asked what was some of the most useless feedback they've received. And one person, uh, she works actually as a uh, costume designer, but she had this great story where someone came back to her and said, well, I like it, but can you make it 10% cooler? <laughs> I'm not really sure what 10% cooler looks like and what that means, how that's different from 20% cooler. Yeah. But she wrote with it and, and tried to make that work. Um, but with all of these stories, basically what we're looking at is that we're in a situation as freelancers where we are constantly in conflict with our clients. And that's not anything that we like. Um, it makes us miserable. It makes them miserable and we do not enjoy that space. Um, as I've been working with clients and also speaking with other um, freelancers, I found that there were four main reasons that we end up in conflict with our clients. Um, and here's what they are. The first one is that deadlines aren't met. Either we don't need a deadline or they don't need a deadline. And that tends to cause some, project, um, some conflict. Um, the other one is adding extras. Um, clients ask for, oh, could you just add this thing, or could you just add that thing, and you want to be nice, and so you say yes to the first thing, because you think, oh, it's just going to take 10 minutes, and then there's another 10 minutes, and then another 10 minutes, and then before you know it, you've added like hours and hours of unpaid work to your project, and that's not a good space to be in. Um, another one is a lack of understanding. This is huge. A lot of times clients ask for things 
and they just don't understand what they're asking for. Um, either they think they have an amazing idea that's actually not, um, for example, the sub, um, or they will ask us to do something that they think is a very, very simple change because in their mind it is, but it actually takes hours and hours to develop something, that functionality out. Um, and then the last reason is fear. Uh, there is a lot of fear um, in our clients, and it, we may not be always aware of that. Um, but the reason that the clients hire us is because we are the experts. We know what's going on with building uh, WordPress. We understand development and design. Uh, we understand online strategy. Um, and they don't to the same extent. And that's a somewhat scary place to be in, because they're paying sometimes thousands of dollars for something that they're not even 100% sure how it works. They don't know if they're gonna get what they want. Um, they don't know if they're gonna get what they need. And so because of that fear, it starts to create some undesirable communication patterns. Um, controlling or micromanaging or just getting really demanding all the time. And being able to recognize that as a fear response is really helpful in finding ways to help to eliminate those kinds of negative interactions that we have with our clients. All right, so the question is then what do we do? So we've talked about how client relationships can be tricky and difficult to manage, um, and we're gonna then jump into what we can do. Um, one thing that unfortunately we can't do is there's no magic button that just makes them better. I wish that it was, um, but we can't actually change what anybody else does. The only thing we have control over is what we do. And the good news is that there is actually a lot that we can do in order to take control of client relationships, to be strong and compassionate leaders in those spaces, and ultimately to craft a better experience. So along those lines, we are gonna look at three steps to create better clients. Now my father was a public speaker, so growing up I was told that you must do things in groups of three and they all must start with the same letter. So you are welcome. I have created an obviously brilliant mnemonic device for you all today. And we are going to look at expectations, edges, which is my B e word for boundaries, and education. Um, with expectations, we're going to talk about how we set expectations, what sorts of expectations should we set, um, and why it's important to do that. The main reason being that human beings across the board tend to handle things better when they know what to expect. Even if you have something really, really difficult in your future, if you know that it's coming, you can prepare yourself for it, and then that process is gonna go much more smoothly. Boundaries is really important, um, particularly because it creates a culture of respect within the relationship that you're building with your client. If, they, if you do not respect your own boundaries, they will not respect your boundaries. And so by setting the beginning of the relationship with respect by using boundaries, um, everything begins to run much more smoothly. And then finally, we're going to look at education. Um, as I was mentioning, a lot of conflict comes from just a simple lack of understanding. Our clients don't know everything that they need to know, and it's not their job to know it. That's why we're here. So our job, in addition to helping to deliver a beautifully created WordPress site or a beautiful design or whatever it might be that you're working on with your clients, it is our job to also respectfully teach them what it is that we're doing for them and how it is that they're going to be able to use that to become more successful in their business or organization. All right, so we're gonna get started on setting expectations. Uh, we're mostly gonna camp out here today Setting expectations is probably the single most helpful thing that we can do as we're seeking to find a better way to relate to our clients. So let's start off by talking about why expectations matter. Um, so there's two things that are really helpful to understanding why we should even bother setting expectations. So the first is giving a big picture. Um, it's important at the beginning of every project that you very clearly lay out the big picture of what's going to be happening in that project. Um, you go from beginning to end and you let your client know exactly what it is that you're planning to do. Now you don't have to go into super fine granular detail of I will mock this up in Photoshop and I will use this many layers of my Photoshop. Um, that's not important. But do let them know this is when we're going to work on strategy and this is what I will give you at the end of that strategy and then we'll move into design and then to development. And you kind of lay the whole process out for them. Um, the reason to do this is it's letting your client know that you know what's going on. 
and they understand that you are in control of the process. And so that helps to minimize some of that controlling behavior um, that we see in a lot of our clients where they try to seize control or they'll try to micromanage us. A lot of that comes from them not knowing what the big picture is, and so they feel like they have to drive the project forward when in actuality that's just not the case. Um, the second one is feeling prepared. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's easier to handle difficult things when you know that they're coming. And inevitably with every project, there are going to be difficulties. Um, the more experience you have, the better you're gonna be able to forward project when those difficulties are. But uh, just the ones that you already do know about, um, you can begin to help them understand what difficult things might be coming up and how they can handle that. All right, so let's talk about then what expectations to set. Um, so there's four main areas of expectation setting, specifically for design and development projects that are very, very useful. Um, the first is setting schedules and deadlines. Um, so we need to, in this area, clearly communicate to them what our deadlines are um, and what their deadlines are. So it's not just about, okay, I will have a finished website to you by this date, but it's at what point will these different like um, deliverables be handed to you? Um, when do I need feedback from you? Um, because the client deadlines are just as important as ours. Um, the other thing that's really important to do is clearly communicate from the beginning what's going to happen if a deadline is missed. Um, so, for instance, if you have clients who are writing their own content, which often happens, um, they will have to have all that content to you by a certain point in time in order for the project to continue to move forward as planned. Um, more often than not, I have found that clients will almost always miss that deadline. Um, clients getting you content on time is probably one of the single biggest issues with building websites um, to the point where I actually mostly don't let my clients write their own content anymore. Um, but what happens is it's important to let them know what happens if they miss that deadline. Um, so for instance, it's a very logical thing for a client to think, oh, if I'm a week late on my deadline of getting client content in, then the website will also be pushed back by one week. But maybe you have another project scheduled and you actually don't have time to do it the week after the original launch date. And so actually if they miss their deadline by a week, it's going to push their launch back by a month. Um, these are very reasonable things that might happen, but it's good to communicate that up front so that the clients know ahead of time, oh, this deadline is really important because it's not just me losing a week, it's me losing a month. And so by communicating all of these myths, all what happens if something is missed, what happens if something goes wrong up front is very helpful. It also then keeps you from seeming punitive later on down the road when that inevitably happens. And then you come back and say, oh, well, you missed it by a week, which means that our launch date is pushed back by a month. That's going to cause conflict if the person doesn't know ahead of time that that's what's coming up. Um, another one is deliverables and scope. So this one's also super important. Before you begin working on the project, it is vital that you write down in writing exactly what it is that you're going to be giving to them. Um, and saying, I will build you a website is not enough of a deliverable. It needs to be, I will build you a website with a homepage that has a rotating slider on it, and there will be an about page and a contact form and also, oh, you want like three pages of the different um, aspects of your organization? Great, we will include those three pages um, and clearly lay out what is going to be given to them. Um, will you have to do custom design work? Or will they be providing all of the design? Um, will they be writing content for you? Or will you have to be writing up the content on those pages? Um, get that all nailed down in writing before you start the project. So that way, if you start to get into the situation where the client says, oh, actually, could we add a page about, you know, an FAQ page? Then you can say, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be this much extra. And you're justified in being able to say that because you have a predefined list of deliverables. The FAQ page is not on that list of deliverables. So it's very easy then to have the conversation about why someone needs to pay extra for those things that they're asking. Um, and then you get into less of that gray area where you're not quite sure how to tell people no. Um, next is involvement. It's really important to set expectations for clients with how involved they're going to be in the project. 
Um, so if you're doing a simple migration, like say they have their website on Squarespace and they want to put it on WordPress and they just want a straight transfer over, client's probably not going to need to be too involved. Like you get some login information and some server information from them and then you can just work and give them the project at the end. Um, but if you're building something from scratch, the client's going to have to be very involved. Um, they're going to need to be involved in strategy and branding sessions if that's what you're doing. Um, if you are still pulling together exactly what sorts of pages need to be there, they're going to have to be involved in that. They may have to gather images from their business, or they might have to sit down with an interview in an interview with you, so that way you can gather from them all the important information about their business that you need to write up all of their content. And so it's important to let the clients know how involved they're going to be. Because again, a very reasonable expectation is, I have signed the contract, you will now build the thing. Um, but that's not always the case. But they're not expected to know that. They shouldn't know that. That's our job to let them know. Um, and then lastly is any difficult situations that might arise. Um, and again, it's hard to know exactly what that's going to be because those are different for each type of project that you're doing as well as for your individual workflow. Um, but the more projects you know, the more you're going to be able to anticipate where those difficult areas are. Um, some great examples of this are that I've run into. Um, I work with a lot of nonprofits, and nonprofits tend to have a board that runs them, so there's no single decision maker at a nonprofit. That's going to slow things down because you send something to them for approval, they can't approve it until the whole board can get together. And that means organizing people's schedules and what have you. Yes? Yeah, we have a name for it, Designed by Committee. Yes, exactly, <laughs> the Designed by Committee thing. Um, and so that's really difficult. So if you know that you're working with a company that where there is not a single decision maker, you're going to want to buffer the heck out of that schedule. We'll talk about how you do that later. Um, another example is, um, <clears throat> Uh, like I've been mentioning, if the client is going to be writing their own content, let them know ahead of time that that's a very difficult thing to do. And so they're going to need to plan for like twice the amount of time that they think that they're going to need to spend. And again, if you tell them that this is going to be difficult, when inevitably it turns out that it is difficult, they are less likely to be upset at you that it was hard because you told them ahead of time. <laughs> All right. Um, so moving on from there, we're going to look at what happens when an expectation is not met. Um, so we never mean to miss deadlines or misunderstand something, but it's going to happen. Um, so here are some tips for how we can handle that. Um, it, it is their fault. So if the client has missed a deadline or misunderstood something that we thought had been clearly explained, um, what we want to do is very clearly and calmly um, lay out what was missed and then immediately follow that up with some sort of a positive plan for how to get back on track or a way to turn this unfortunate situation into an opportunity to do something better. Um, as the one pointing out the problem, the great thing is that we are in a position of power to take charge of the tone and to set the expectation for how bad things get handled. Um, if we can do that in a very positive, calm sort of way, our clients are much more likely to respond in kind. Um, if we come at it in an accusatory, you missed your deadline, I guess there's nothing I can do about that, um, then it's setting a tone of confrontation and apathy for the whole re the rest of the relationship. Um, and that's just something we want to avoid. Um, being aware that we are the leaders in this relationship is very important. And being able to lead even in these situations of failed expectation is super important to maintaining positive relationships moving forward. Um, if it's your fault, own that you made a mistake. Um, don't try to make excuses, don't be vague about it, um, don't try to blame someone else or blame the weather or whatever it was. Um, clients will absolutely respect you more if you own your mistakes and apologize for them and then set out a plan for how you're going to make it right. Um, and that last part is really important. Don't just say, I missed a deadline, sorry. Um, but explain how you're going to either make up that lost time 
or how you're going to give them a discount because you've made a mistake, um, or add an extra deliverable free of charge. Um, one thing I did once when I um, ended up missing a deadline because of like personal things that came up, I just wasn't able to do it. Um, I was working with them on some logo design, so I just mocked up a business card for them. And I said, hey, I'm really sorry that this happened. Uh, free of charge, here is this business card design that you're able, that you guys can use. Um, and you don't need to pay for that. And they were thrilled. They thought that was the best thing ever, and they were not at all worried about the fact that I missed the deadline. Um, another great example of this um, actually just happened this month. Um, I just signed a new client for an author, and I told her that I would have our strategy document and brand board done, and then it turned out I needed to take my mom to the East Coast for um, a specialized hospital visit that she had to go on. Um, and that ended up being way more intense than I thought it was going to be, and I had no time to get any work done. Um, so what I did in order with that is, I did know that I was going to be going to the East Coast. I thought that it was going to be a lot less stressful, and that I would have more time to work on projects. Um, so I did tell her um, when we had been talking, I just kind of dropped it into our conversation that, oh yeah, I'm going to be heading to the East Coast and taking my mom to the hospital. Um, what that did is it let her know that something was coming up. So that way, when inevitably it did end up being a problem, because um, I didn't think it would be a problem, but then it was a problem. Um, but she already knew about it. So then I was able to explain, hey, this was a lot harder than I had expected that it would be on me, and so um, I'm not going to be able to hit this deadline. I'm really sorry. Um, and by letting her know that the situation was coming in a very gentle kind of conversational way, she was already kind of prepared that this maybe would happen. Um, it also keeps it from sounding like a lame excuse um, because she already knew before there was a problem that that was a situation in my life. Instead of like, I missed a deadline and I'm like, uh, and this thing happened. Um, so that's helpful. Um, and then I also told her like, hey, I've cleared out my next week and we're gonna take care of getting caught back up. Um, and if we don't, I haven't told her this yet, but if we don't end up getting caught up because of this, I'm going to give her a discount on the final project. Um, and that's just kind of how I'm handling that particular situation. And it's going really well. Like She's responding very favorably to it, and it's not really causing too much problems. All right, so these are some tools and tactics that we can use for setting expectations. All right, the first one that's super important is timelines. Um, these can be really simple, and honestly, simple is better because they're quicker for busy clients to read. Um, but we want to make sure that those timelines um, are very straightforward, um, and be sure to include feedback periods in these timelines. Um, so usually, if you're send if you're working on a project, you're going to need to send stuff away for client approval before you move on to the next phase. Um, and this is a great expectation to set as well. How long do your clients have? to get you feedback. Is it a couple of days? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Make sure that that's clearly defined ahead of time so that way they know. And then work that into your timeline. So that way they can also see very clearly when I get my you know, homepage mock-up at this date, I need to have feedback on what changes I want to have made by this date. Um, and that helps to keep everything above board and easy to do. Um, next is buffer that schedule. Um, so this is probably most important thing you can do for positive client relationships is buffering the schedule. Um, and I actually learned this while I was on film sets. Um, my, one of my jobs was to be uh, the first assistant director, and what the first assistant director does is they take all the shots, they figure out how long it's going to take to shoot those every single day, and then they're on set making sure that everyone stays on time. And what I learned to do was add in about an hour or two extra buffers every day. Um, because inevitably things would start to run late. Um, what that did is it made sure that, pe that it set up people's expectations that they would be done with work at a certain time. And usually we would wrap out half an hour early, even though technically we were running an hour and a half late. Um, and so what that buffer did is it made people feel really positive because they were stoked. They got off work half an hour early. Everybody's really excited about that instead of timing it exactly the way I thought it would probably go, um, which would make everybody really upset because they were working an hour and a half late. Um, so using this buffering technique is really helpful. So let's say you think you're going to take a month to be able to turn around a website. Buffer that out to a month and a half. 
And then if you finish early, your clients will love you because you finish early, that's awesome. And then if you finish late, which is actually then on time for what you told them, then you're safe and you're covered and nothing really wrong has happened. Um, so buffering is a great tool to use to make sure that those client relationships go well, specifically surrounding deadlines. Um, next is to collaborate on a list of deliverables. And this is really important to do with your client together. Um, clients will, if you sit down and you collaborate together, they are feel that their voices have been heard and that the things that they actually need are going to be included in the project. Um, so if you just hand them a list of deliverables, there's going to be a little bit of that fear response again. They'll be unsure of, um, do they really know what I need? Do they really understand my business? But if you sit down and collaborate with them, then there's a better understanding of, oh, I've been heard, my needs have been met, I can trust this person with something that's very important to me. Um, next is including next steps. So every time that you deliver something to your client, or that you, almost every time that you communicate with them, really, um, it's important to include next steps. Um, this not only helps the clients know exactly what they need to do so they don't panic and think they have to do everything or get really like blasé about it and feel like they have to do nothing. Um, so you keep that pace of the project really clear. Um, but in addition to that, it also shows that you are in control of the project. You know what's going on because you have given them the next steps to do and they know that if they do those steps, they can trust you to take care of everything else. And that also continues to facilitate that feeling that you are a leader that they can trust in this project. Um, and then finally, encourage questions. Questions from your clients are great. Um, and ask them, like encourage them to say, hey, if you have any questions about that, please you know, reply to this email. Or um, if at some point along the way you're not sure how this is working, or you're not even you're not sure if the colors are right, or you're not even sure how to tell if the colors are right, um, please ask and just continue to encourage that dialogue. Not only does that keep good conversation going, so that way as pain points or troubles come up, you're able to jump ahead of those and kind of answer those before they turn into big things. Um, but it also encourages your clients to frame their requests in, oops, sorry about that. But it encourages your clients to frame their requests in the form of a question, um, which continues to put you in the driver's seat. So instead of saying, I absolutely need that FAQ page, they'll more likely say, so what would you think about adding an FAQ page? And it's just a totally different conversation. Instead of having to come straight out and give them a hard no, you can say something like, yeah, I think an FAQ page would be great. It's not quite included in the scope, so let's maybe have a phone call and talk about how we could include that for you. Um, so it puts you in a position of being able to be helpful to them instead of feeling like a roadblock to them. And that's all done just by facilitating question asking. All right, next up is edges, which is also known as boundaries. All right. So talking about why boundaries matter, um, I already talked a little bit about the culture of respect, so we'll move on from that one. Um, but just again, if you set up to set out with your own boundaries respected, your clients are much more likely to also respect your boundaries. Um, the other one is that boundaries help both parties not to take advantage of each other. Um, so if you have very clear boundaries on the project as well as on yourself personally, um, that's going to help your client not take advantage of you, and it's also going to help you often unknowingly keep from taking advantage of them. And it just helps that relationship to stay very clean and above board and everybody feeling like they're being heard and respected. All right, so there are two types of boundaries that you're going to want to set. One are project boundaries and the other are personal boundaries. So for project boundaries, um, these you can see are all based on expectations that we set previously. So the first one is stick to your deliverables. Once you have that written list of deliverables, do not vary from that unless there is like an exceptionally good reason to do so. Um, and I actually can't currently think of what a really good reason would be um, to vary off of your deliverable list. Um, people are gonna, their, your clients are gonna ask you to do it. They're gonna say, oh, but it's just a small thing. Oh, but it's just a small change. Stick to your guns on what that deliverable list is. Otherwise, as soon as you say, well, okay, I guess we could do this extra thing included in the project, 
you're kind of lost at that point. Um, you're going to go downhill real fast. They're going to start asking for more and more and more, and you're going to have to eventually be framed as the bad guy and step, and step in and say no. Um, by using your deliverable list as the bad guy, it keeps some of that negative emotion off of you and on that agreed upon list. And kind of pushing the negative feelings towards inanimate objects also helps to keep the relationship much more positive. Um, another one is just to watch scope creep. Um, so scope is the agreed upon um, boundaries basically of the project. It's exactly what you said that you would do. Um, it's basically your, your contract, but much more detailed in terms of what you will be delivering to them. Um, scope creep is something we talk about all the time in project management because it is so easy for either the clients to ask for something or for us to think that, hey, we could do this cool thing and it would actually be better. But don't do it. That's not within the scope of the project. You want to keep your scope really carefully defined. And if you want to add extra things, talk to your client about that. Talk about it as an add-on or something you can change. But don't just let that project start to balloon out. Otherwise, again, you're going to have hours and hours of unpaid work um, that you're just never going to get back. And that really sucks. Um, lastly, uh, the power of a polite no. When you need to set boundaries, always just make sure to do it very politely, but very firmly. So if they are calling you at like 9 o'clock at night, which is just not a thing that, unless you really like answering client calls at 9 o'clock at night, <laughs> the great thing about freelancing, you can set whatever hours you want. If that's your jam, go for it. I hate that. I'm not going to answer client calls at 9. So if someone's constantly calling me at 9 o'clock, later in the tomorrow, the next day, I will usually send them an email and say, hey, I noticed you called. Just so you know, I don't take calls after 5 or 6 p.m., um, but I'd love to set up a call with you today. What can we do? Um, so it's very politely letting them know what my boundary is, and again, giving a positive action plan forward of how we can meet their need without breaking the boundary. And that kind of goes into personal boundaries. Um, so the first personal boundary that you need to be very clear about for yourself is what is your availability. Um, again, the great thing about being freelancers is we do. We get to set our own hours. If we want to spend all day hanging out at Disneyland and work until 1 o'clock in the evening, or I guess technically the morning, we can do that. That's great. Um, but just because we're working at late at night doesn't mean that our clients need to have access to us late at night. Um, so setting those availability boundaries is really important. Do you take calls over the weekend? Do you not? Do you take calls only during a certain number of hours during the day? Do you only talk to clients Monday, Wednesday, Friday? However you want to set it up, that's totally in your ballpark, or in your court. That's your job. You get to decide what it is. Um, but once you decide what it is, <laughs> stick with that and do not let anything push you out of that unless, again, there's like a really good actual emergency reason for it. Um, the next one is response time. Um, when a client sends you an email, um, it's really important to consider not responding to it right away. Um, and the reason for that being that if you constantly respond to emails right away over and over and over, what you're actually doing is setting an expectation that you are constantly available to your client. Um, if the client has paid for you to be constantly available to them, that's awesome. Answer their emails right away. Um, but if they aren't paying extra for that constant access, consider letting it sit for an hour or two before you respond to it, just to kind of build in some boundaries so that way they know that if they um, email you, you might not respond right away and that that's okay. Um, the next thing is professional distance. This is especially important if you are working with clients who are also your friends. Um, so a lot of times when we're starting out as freelancers, we are working with our pool of family and friends to get our first projects. And that can get really dicey because we're working with people who we know. And what can be really helpful is to have a conversation ahead of time about this and say, hey, when we're working on the project, we're having a professional relationship, and all other times it's our personal relationship. And setting a really clear divide between those two things. And when you're working with your clients and it's on client time, don't talk about personal stuff. Um, if your client is someone who would like to be your friend, that is awesome if you want them to be your friend, but wait until after the project's done. And then start to pursue more of that friendly, 
cadence and conversation with them. Um, otherwise, um, you're more, your clients are more likely to make inappropriate requests of you um, because they feel like you're their friend instead of someone that they've hired to do a job for. Um, and so you just want to keep that line really, really clear um, until the project is over. And then, you know, do whatever you like. Um, and that comes back to the last one, which is be helpful, but not too nice. Um, so always be helpful. Um, helpful, though, does not always mean saying yes. So you can be helpful and still say no. And that's really important. Um, your clients do not need you to be nice to them. They need you to be helpful. And keeping that distinction in mind is really important. Um, now, when I say they don't need you to be nice, that doesn't mean that you know you should be a jerk. Um, but you don't have to do everything they ask. You don't have to um, constantly be there and be trying to please them. Um, that's not actually a helpful dynamic to cultivate in a client relationship. Instead, you should be the expert who is incredibly helpful to them. And that is a better position to put yourself in. All right. Um, so here then, what do we do when a boundary is crossed? Um, so first you need to ask yourself, have I set an expectation? If you didn't set an expectation, then it's important to um, use this as an opportunity to jump in and address that expectation. Um, then you'll want to like politely address the problem, um, suggest an alternate way that the client can have their needs met, and then again, just stick to your guns. Do not cross boundaries unless you have an extremely good reason to do so or unless they're paying you extra. All right. Um, we're going to jump through education pretty quickly. Um, education is pretty straightforward. Um, by educating our clients, it's helping to remove some of the fear that they feel. Um, again, a lot of clients don't understand how the internet works or how WordPress works um, or how design or online strategy or marketing works. By helping them to learn as you go through the project and educating them along the way, what you're doing is you're empowering their success. Because ultimately, your goal is for them to take their website and go use it out in the wild, away from you. And if they don't know how to use it, then they're going to constantly be nervous and afraid about that situation, which means they're going to constantly be emailing you, asking you to do things, and hoping not to pay you for it. Um, so you can avoid that by empowering them to do like basic everyday maintenance or understanding of their website and then saying, hey, if you need something bigger done or if you just don't want to bother with the maintenance of the site, let me know. I charge X amount per hour and you can move forward from there. Um, and then just a quick, couple of quick touches on finding educational moments. Um, the first thing you want to do is gauge your client's knowledge base. If they are someone who knows absolutely nothing about the internet, explaining that you are going to be building out their website in HTML and CSS with a little bit of JavaScript and Ajax thrown in is not going to be helpful. Um, instead, just say, hey, I'm going to be coding your site. This is how it's going to work. And you want to give them a surface level understanding that they'll be able to work with. If they know more, go deeper. That's awesome. And kind of let them set the pace for how much knowledge they feel like they need to be confident. And that's going to be a give and take. You're going to have to kind of go along and get to feel, get them to know your client and you'll know how that works. Um, also stay goal oriented. So you want to educate them towards their success and make sure that they're clear on that it's success that they are, that the reason you're teaching them these things is so they can be ultimately successful. Um, explain everything before you do it. So before you jump into designs, explain to them what the design process looks like. Before you give them a brand board, explain to them what branding is. So that way they have some sort of a foundation of knowledge to interpret whatever deliverable you're about to give them. Um, and lastly, continue encouraging questions, just like we talked about in the setting expectations section. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today then is empowerment. Um, so the reason that these three major aspects of good client relationships matter is because what you're actually doing is you're empowering your clients to succeed. Um, and when clients feel empowered, they do not feel like they need to grab that power away from you because they already have it. So if you set them up to be successful, if you set them up to feel like they know what's going on, um, not only are they going to have a better relationship with you, um, but they're also more likely to just feel really awesome about having worked with you on this project because they started out not knowing how to fix a problem with their business and they ended, after working with you, feeling really empowered and amazing 
and like they know how to solve their problem now. Um, which leads to them probably recommending you. Like by maintaining this good client relationship, by empowering your clients to be successful through setting those expectations, by keeping clear boundaries, and by educating them along the way, you're going to get a really solid client experience um, that will likely lead to more word of mouth and your business will grow and grow and grow. And that is why we bother having good communication with our clients. Not only are they more successful, but we also become successful on the other side of that. All right. So we've got about, I think, six or seven minutes left. So before we wrap everything up for today, do people have any specific questions about any of this? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so I feel like, sure, sorry, should I stand? Sure, go for it. Um, I feel like a lot of, like, a lot of the stuff was great, but I kind of feel like it's very, like, hypothetical and, like, just like what you should do. Mm -hmm. uh, like me and my coworker over here, we actually work in an agency. Um, and there's a lot of us not interacting directly with the client. So a lot of the stuff is like internal access. And it's stuff that like we can like obviously we can deal. Mm -hmm. And then we don't mind approving because like these people are like our coworkers. We have to, we have to live with them every day. Um, like, what would your advice be? to kind of just say no. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's like, a great question. Like, to clients or like to client work requests or to your coworkers? To our coworkers and say, like, as like, as, like instruction to tell them to just start saying no or like to take stuff like this. Oh, so like telling your coworkers who are engaging directly with the clients to say no to them. Yeah, should I tell them to come to WordCamp 2019? <laughs> And yes, then, you absolutely class. can. Okay. Um, the other thing to do is you can always frame that in terms of how it will help you. Yeah. Um, so if you, so people tend to like being told that they're good people, um, and so if you can frame being told, if you can frame the no in terms of empowering them to do a good thing, okay. um, they will tend to respond a lot better. Um, so one thing, I've definitely had to deal with that before, um, especially when I was just starting out, I wasn't liaising directly with my clients, and so like scope creep was just happening like crazy. Um, and so what I did was I sat down, I asked if I could, hey, can we sit down for coffee or something, because at that point it was a bigger thing. If it's not a big thing, then just, you know, say it in the hallway. Um, and say, hey, I was noticing that this project is kind of ballooning out a little bit, and I don't know that that's good for like the overall budget of the company because we need to make sure that it stays within what we agreed on. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to be losing money. Yeah. Um, and then asking them, is there, you know, I'm noticing that I'm doing a lot of extra stuff that we weren't agreeing on. Is that something that they're paying for or are we, or am I actually like doing stuff that is losing the company money? Um, and you can kind of frame it in terms of letting them feel like they are making something better for your company. Um, and then that no becomes a lot easier because they can be like, that's true, I do want to save the company money. And then they go out and they say no. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so one of the things I've really been wondering for like a long time is how do you price additional deliverables for clients? And how do you, um, like, is there a formula, and how do you, like, soften the blow to clients that adding a certain piece of functionality is going to be very expensive? Um, and, like, what are some, like, tiers of services that we would charge more based on, like, the level of difficulty, and what would some of those more difficult services be that you would be able to charge a client more for? That's a great question. So the question was, um, if we're adding something to the contract, how do we charge for that? Um, first off, you have to decide if you're charging per project um, or if you're charging by the hour. Um, I tend to like to estimate things by the hour and then turn that into a per project cost. Um, so whatever your hourly rate is, estimate about how many hours you think it's going to take you to build that out, buffer it a little bit, and then charge them down now. Um, and then what I usually do is include anything that I think they might want to add as add-ons in my initial proposal. So that way they can see how much it will cost beforehand, 
Um, and then they can decide no initially if they want to, and then when they inevitably decide they want to add it, um, there's already a price point on that, and so you don't have to be the one who's coming in and saying, well, that's $1,000, or that's $10,000, or however much it's going to be. Um, they know that ahead of time. And then also, by seeing how much those extra add-ons might cost, if they end up asking for something that's not on that list, you've already kind of set an expectation for about how much extra stuff costs. Um, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. What would be like an average, like an hourly rate you could let, like say to a client, just like as something that they're reasonable? <laughs> <laughs> like, because you have to explain why they're charging that much, so I'm just like. Yeah, so there's a huge range, and it depends on what you're doing and what your um, experience level is. Um, I, I feel bad giving you like a straight number. Like I know people who successfully charge anything from like fifty dollars an hour to like one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars an hour. Um, what you might want to do is um, actually, since we're running short on time, let's chat about this afterwards. If you have a couple of minutes, and I can kind of get a better feel for what it is that you're actually offering to your clients, and I can give you a better ballpark for that. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, last question. Uh, how do you uh, break up with a client? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Especially if they're nuts. <laughs> yeah, if they're crazy. Um, so first off, I really hope they're not your friend. Because if they're your friend, it gets infinitely more complicated. If they are not your friend, um, I've actually had to do this. I've had to tell a couple clients, you know, um, we're just done with this project. Um, usually, I try to keep a list of reasons why that something has not gone well. Um, and then, again, trying to keep it really positive. Um, so if you feel like the relationship can handle you explaining, again, very respectfully, um, what boundaries are being crossed and why this makes it no longer viable to work with them, um, you can do that. Um, another reason is, and, and I don't like doing this, but sometimes some clients are really kind of crazy and just need to do this, um, just get real busy. Um, <laughs> just say, hey, I'm so sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> but just say, hey, I'm so sorry, I'm not going to be able to complete this project. I've had some other stuff come up, you can be kind of vague about it, it's okay, you're hopefully not going to have to meet, deal with these people again. Um, and just tell them, I'm so sorry I can't, Upwork is a great place, go to Upwork and find another freelancer. Um, and you're still giving them a solution for how they can solve their problem. Um, and sometimes you just have to do that. Um, but yeah, I would say gauge them if you feel like they're really crazy people, just be busy. Um, otherwise, if you feel like the relationship can handle it, give them a list of the boundaries that they have broken and explain why you're ending the contract. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming.